It is necessary for the recording of sound to convert the sound waves to corresponding changes in light. The sound the waves sound. produced by my voice are transmitted through the air to the microphone where these sound waves are converted to changes in an electric current. These variations in the electric current are then amplified and used to control the light. This varying beam of light falling on the photoelectric cell produces variations in the electric current which are directly proportional to the variations in the light beam. The sound track. As the varying electrical current in the photoelectric cell is small, a vacuum tube amplifier is required to increase it to the point where it will operate a loudspeaker. Soundtrack. What is up, everyone? Welcome to the Occult Rejects. In this episode, I have, uh, well, obviously myself, and I have uh, Ethan Indigo. Um, he's been on the show before, and I think on the uh, NY Patriot show. I'm not sure, actually, anymore. Yeah, I think. Which, I think both, maybe. Or, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. And uh, we've had him on before, and I had some really interesting discussions. And, uh, you know, I've told him in the past, whenever you have a topic you'd like to talk about, just hit me up, and I think we can make it happen. And he hit me up to talk about, uh, you know, Toth and the number eight. And, uh, you know, I just had Branch on recently. And I thought that was a great uh, discussion. And like I've said before, I've seen him in chat and he's always added some good stuff. And uh, I wanted to bring him into the mix because I just thought it'd be, uh, you know, the three of us, a good discussion. Unfortunately, I had the Headless Giant also that was supposed to uh, jump on with us. And we were having technical difficulties with him for a bit because of the echo, and then he just can't even get onto the internet now. So, unfortunately, he will be missed, but uh, hopefully on the next one, he will join us. Um, that's enough out of me. I'm going to let these gentlemen uh, introduce themselves. Uh, Branch, I'll let you go, and then we'll leave it up to uh, Ethan after that. Well, it's good to be back so soon. Uh, my name's Joshua. I go by the Branch, or NPC 3.14. When I'm doing uh, streams, you can find me on Telegram as the branch. Uh, I'm always happy to strike up a conversation with folks and uh, perhaps be a guest. And uh, you can find me on Instagram as Appalachian Aesthetic. I've been uh, into occult studies and religion studies for many years now. I'm a Freemason and belong to the Orthodox Church. So... This is the type of stuff I really enjoy, and the mysteries of life, and also sharing them with others. Thank you very much. Sir. Beautiful. Awesome, and thank you very much for coming on again, like you said, and even in a, such a short uh, notice and time. And uh, his links, I'm pretty sure right now are already in the live. I'm pretty sure I copied them over from the last show that he was on. If not, I'm sorry, but I'm almost 100% positive they're in there now, as well as Ethan's. But uh, Ethan, introduce yourself and let everybody know who you are again. Most excellent. Honored to be here discussing with you guys, communicating with you. Thank you so much, Nick Patriot. Of course. Man. Um, uh, Ethan Indigo Smith, I've written a few books. I, you know, always come into things from a universalist perspective, um, trying to, um, you know, find the correspondences with within different systems or diff supposedly different systems. Um, I practice Tai Chi. And, uh, and I, I write a lot. <laughs> um, and <clears throat> so the idea that uh, I recently um, was considering would be a good discussion is how um, seven is. Um, I was afraid this would happen. Oh, well, well uh, that's what happens when you go live. So tonight's topic is eight. Yes, is that what eight, he was yes. about to say? Yeah, eight, yeah, eight and, uh, and Toth. <coughs> and, you know, funny little tidbit. I was going to mention this anyway, so I'll just bring this up now just to waste time. Uh, when he had hit me up about this, I had just got done recording something, uh, one of the Gilgo Beach episodes, and uh, I was talking about how I think, like, Shannon Gilbert, I think, I may be wrong, but like one of the one of the parts of her names or whatever, like also equal Toth, 
And she also has a story of uh, of uh, being at house number eight <laughs> at, on Gilgo Peach where she was. And uh, I was just like, yo, that's like really weird how like she was on house number eight and Toth even comes up in her name. So I mentioned that and I just thought it was weird. And like literally a few hours after I did that, uh, recorded that he had hit me up and told me oh i have an idea talking about toth equaling the number eight and i was like what the fuck <laughs> i was like oh you gotta come on now it's just the timing was so damn weird you know and i was just like sure why not so it strikes me interesting about eight is how uh it, it reminds me a little bit of pisces or cancer how it mirrors itself yeah. and has this almost like a dualism in it. And Hermes is a lot of times associated with Thoth in yes. that Thoth Atlantean uh, role. And uh, Mercury is the solvent that brings the male and female together. So really you could almost view the eight Ooh. as masculine and feminine kind of united. I was saying that to him earlier that, uh, well, both, I, I agree with both things you just said. Um, and hopefully like we're not talking too much about stuff that he was going to bring up, but I was even telling him before how sometimes I do think that's kind of like seven is more of like maybe like the feminine energy and like the one is the male energy that like f like fuels it or, you know, um, I guess, you know, gives it life or whatever, the energy within it. So I was even saying like I think that like eight could just be like the one and the seven together, you know, or still representing basically what you were saying, male and female together. I do think it's both energies working together. You know, it's kind of interesting because nine does kind of look like a seven and an eight together, you know, if you really just look. At it. I didn't think about that till just now. Me and him were even saying before you jumped on that uh, even nine, you know, going by certain, uh, I mean, even if you were to go into, not to bring him up, Crowley 777 or anybody other's books of, uh, you know, correlations and stuff like that, a lot of people do attribute Toth also with the moon. So, I mean, again, if you want to go back to mm -hmm. Kabbalistic uh, numerology and stuff like that, which, which I'm sure these people think of before they start making these these lists, um, I, I can see how Toth would also go with nine. You know? May I uh, interject real quick? Welcome back, Ethan. Oh, um, yeah. Sorry. Sorry for the bad uh, connection, you guys. I wasn't sure if this would come up organically. And so since you mentioned the moon, I would say that uh, both the moon and the sun have this analemma pattern kind of that they follow in the sky, like an eight mm. um, oh, infinity sign. Man. Although it's not perfectly symmetrical, it seems to be elongated on one end with the sun. Yes, so, um, yes, you're right. But I, I could see the association with eight and the moon being pretty solid there. Yeah, no, real, cool. real quick before we let Ethan get back, you're mentioning that eight us kind of thing. Um, in the eyeball series that we did, I'm almost positive it was near the first or second part. Teresa had we were covering something with the eye, and Teresa had brought that up and was like somehow showing that with something with the eyeball. So that's interesting because like you can see like it's almost a small end and a fatter end. Like you were saying, it's not mm -hmm. perfect, you know. And if you think about it, it's almost kind of like a like a maybe like a fish with a small tail or something weird like that. I don't know, but it's definitely not perfect. All right, so there you go. Uh, Ethan is back. Yeah. Oh, thanks, thanks, you guys. Of uh, course. That's why I got Branch the, here, in case you disappear. You know, we can chat. Yeah, it. <laughs> yeah and, and hopefully that doesn't fart out again. Uh, so Thoth, of course, is celebrated in the City of Eight. Uh, I'm, I'm presuming you guys presented and discussed a little bit. Um, and uh, he also is... Uh, comes in different iterations, but but this this city of eight, I think, is one of the oldest. Of course, being Egyptian, and and in a sense, he's kind of riding on the eight needers, the Ogduad of the needers, being primordial Egyptian gods and goddesses, and actually, the eight, as we'll see in a lot of a lot of senses, is uh, for pair. Right. And, and so the Ogdoad of the Needers is actually four pairs, four couples of masculine and feminine gods and goddesses. Um, you see, that's and, interesting because I, I, I hate to just interrupt you, but like I've always no, said, please, I think, no, um, you, feel that way. you know, Toth is like a, a lower arc of uh, like Chesed or Jupiter. And, you know, you would get like the four and the multiplying to eight. 
in that. Right. In that and, and I was going to say, Thoth through the Bin Ben table um, is associated with the tarot. And one way, I'm not a tarot reader or practitioner, but I know there are different ways to read the tarot of the four suits. And if so, if they're upright or upside down, that is, um, you know, uh, there's eight ways, right? There's eight kind of dynamic, a four pair, if you will. Um, and so Thoth uh, is... Uh, worshiping these primordial gods or energies. And in that sense, it, we can maybe intuit that that's how he's able to uh, transverse dimensions, right? And and uh, that's Thoth's big thing is he's even able to help Ra, who can't do what he can do by his power on, on the physical realm. He's, he can go into the metaphysical realm as well. He was the one who wrote the magic spell to bring uh, Osiris back right. for Isis. I mean, he was even involved in that. Most people may not know that. Yeah, he's always <laughs> always finalizing and assisting the problem, the solution to the problem. Uh, maybe not always, but so many times, so frequently. Um, may I, uh, please, just to kind of add on to that, um, one of those things he aided in as well was the. Uh, didn't he help define the eye of wisdom for uh, Atum when it uh, fled from him in the abyss? So he went and found the eye. Well, he went and found his children first, which was the two lions, um, Tefnut and uh, the other two lion children. He fetched them from the abyss. And um, then also when Sophia ran from him, he found her and coaxed her back. Um, so yeah. I think that there's this association too, maybe with the the blue right eye of uh, wisdom. I think it would, it would be perhaps Go ahead. Uh, beautiful, man. And and that story too, I believe it's very specific how many times Thoth has to call her on Ra's behalf, one thousand and seventy seven times. Oh, I is, forgot about that. <laughs> which is three short of 1080, three short of 1080, right? Which is three 360s, of course, and, and also just a, a neat number. One, oh, it's 10 of 180, uh, excuse me, 108 as well. Um, <clears throat> so interesting aspect of that story, uh, Thoth being the assistant that cries. That, and Teresa adds that there's eight limbs of yoga, which is a wonderful build because that's another eight element dynamic that really helps us deal with the gravity of the situation, which is earthly existence. <laughs> um, <laughs> you said it and, well. <laughs> and and the, the, there's also the eightfold path of Buddhism, which is very much um, – in line with let me let me present this quote but buddha presents the uh the uh the problem that is this existence the um in a fourfold dynamic right um there is suffering there is a solution to suffering the solution is the eightfold path uh i forget the third and however the order is um but essentially like that in a forethought process so the may I, uh, please may I interject real quick? Please. As you were saying that, in my mind, I saw the separate tree in the in the paths. So the, is right. the eightfold path perhaps translated to the separate? Anyway, I'm sorry to interrupt. No, no, it's an it's an interesting thought, and it reminds me of the chakra system is seven, right? Of course, we know yeah. it as seven most frequently, but it can also be thought of as a different number sets but within within eight we have this um uncomprehension to help us deal with uh the elements uh, 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 of reality but in the seven the importance of the seven and why eight is um overlooked with the seven the seven is crucial because it has a center point and and with the chakra system the center is the heart chakra Right. So so the seven is crucial for that. But there is still the invisible eighth 
Um, and so um, Pantanjali is said to be the author of the Yoga Sutras, who uh, uh, this is where we get the eight limbs of yoga from. And Patanjali, um, obviously from India and Tibet uh, uh, type of um, area, he uh, um, has a snake body and he comes from heaven. Um, and back to Thoth, excuse me, before I continue, he carries a staff and is very snake-like. Um, and his staff has the two snakes, which when they wrap together, form another aspect a symbolical depiction of eight, Good right? Point. And and so, um, Pantanjali is actually one could consider um, uh, iteration of this Thoth energy, right? And he brings to us the eight limbs of yoga, among many other teachings, wisdom teachings, metaphysical teachings, and healing teachings, just like that Thoth energy of Egypt is said to. I'm only going to try to interrupt when I already have. No, to I love it. Down. And if you're not interrupting, you this is a great book. I was thinking, like, how am I going to bring these things up? And then you'll mention them. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so you mentioned the two snakes on the Caduceus staff. Well, another place we see two snakes intertwined in a way is in that uh, very famous imagery. I actually just checked out a book at the library today with this very thing on it. The, uh, the red and white dragons of alchemy. Um, the Yorboros that's eating its tail. We see those same two serpents going in a circle there. Um, oh, that is <laughs> feed freeze. Uh, oh, yeah, I think so. Hoping to get his response to that because yeah. it really. So that would be like the Ida and the Pingala. Yes, that's twin what I serpents. Think. Yeah. I, and, think, I think somebody may have mentioned it or maybe I brought it up. But like even like you know joking around, but like the never-ending story, which is you know something I've referred to a bunch of times for occult symbolism. Even oh, in yeah. that, it's on the front of the book that the kids reading. That's uh, the uh, the Arwen. Is or something that's very close looking to like all these different you know, intertwining. It's snakes. a silver and gold snake, actually. I used to always think it was the same color, but when I looked oh, at really? it really closely, yeah, they're two different colors, and. Uh, he has to kind of unite those two sides of himself in order to complete his journey. So I think that symbol is very much the symbol of the hero's journey in a way, um, like the completion of the great work, mm. that sort of thing. Yes. And um, one of my favorite scenes from that movie is when he's traversing the desert and he's got a pass between the two sphinxes. And that's where he has his heart tested and his armor. Um you know, he has invisible armor, armor of faith. You know, the, the knight uh, trundles along on the horse and gets zapped and <laughs> killed, but he has that invisible armor, which is um, kind of like what we read about in the Bible when it talks about the armor of God in Ephesians. Um, so we see that uh, Atreyu has that. Um, Ethan, we were talking about the way this this two snake motif could relate to the two snakes of alchemy or the Ida and Pangala. Oh, beautiful. Oh, okay. He's back. So that's I, kind of I, where we left off. Right. Yeah. And I heard briefly the, the white and red snake. Um, and that's, that's right there, you know, in, in line with that power, right. That, that idea. Yeah. Well, beautiful. You got the picture right there. Cool. Yeah, yeah, if your bandwidth was... keeps becoming an issue, you could even try uh, just using your mic and not your camera. Oh, yeah. No, I think it's beyond that. But <laughs> oh, Okay. <laughs> I think uh, one of the things I mentioned about the never-ending story was how, uh, you know, that is a kind of a story of the hero's journey, and he has to sure. unite those two sides of himself. I had sure, and the uh, Patanjali has the snake aspect um, below his waist, um, and human form above. So, which kind of lends to that uniting um, of our primal nature with our higher self type of thing. Abraxas mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. no, and no, the chariot card. Sorry if I'm like getting ahead of stuff that you had to say. Uh, no, I think I, you kind it. of mentioned it earlier, and I meant to say something, and then I I forgot. Oh, but like, you know, you were talking about how like, uh, like messenger type, 
you know, or uh, in my opinion, I can see how Toth and other gods that he can be associated with are very much in between both worlds, back and forth, back and forth, yeah. you know what I'm saying? And I, I see that sometimes with the eight. You know, I, I wonder and, if that's like part of the yeah. eight. Well, another wonder, so Thoth directly has a relationship with Tarot, which has that intuitive um, um, divination aspect to it. Another iteration of Thoth is in the Norse mythology, right? Odin rides on Slipner, which is his eight-legged horse. Yeah, man. Right? And so, and he is famous for bringing the the uh, measurement of intuition um, system of, of the, the uh, runes. Um, and so... He, but what does he ride on? Eight principles one could symbolog symbologically extract. I'm not saying that's necessarily what it is, but um, um, and he's also able to go through. I think they have nine dimensional understanding um, in that that story set. Um, Wasn't there something I, special about the tail of the horse? as well did it um the, i doesn't i i'm ignorant of what it is but that, i thought that maybe it was a snake or something <laughs> interesting <laughs> well that's 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 uh the possibility um i know um that mostly he's depicted with one head sometimes he had four in in the very few depictions um, oh, Odin? no the horse no the horse oh excuse me no well, that's no. interesting because the heliodrum of Mithraism, or uh, well, the Tetragrammaton as well, and even in Revelation, there are four yeah. horses, and so the oh, Heliodram yeah. is the person sitting in the chariot controlling the four horses. And so that's and really the four, rad. like like I mentioned before, um, the eight is kind of a four pair, right? It's a it's a it's a duality of four in a sense. Um, so the four is there again in the eight. Um, if I may read uh, this uh, Eastern okay. philosophical quick little thing that actually relates the Taoist idea that is kind of integrated all across the world and with this polarity understanding that brings us uh, uh, to the eight. Um, as the great ultimate, or what we call the yin-yang symbol, as, as the great ultimate becomes differentiated, the two modes, yin and yang, appear. Yang descends and interacts with yin, and yin rises to interact with yang. And consequently, the four forms come out of the two, which are main major and minor yin and yang right so and consequently the four forms are constituted yin and yang interact and generate the four forms of heaven the element of weakness the element of strength interact and generate the four forms of earth and consequently the eight elements which is the bagua Heaven, water, fire, thunder, winder, water in motion, mountain, and earth, just for a brief reference. Uh, um, so the eight elements are completed, uh, and the eight elements intermingle and generate the myriad things. In Taoist philosophy, that's how the yin and yang kind of encompasses everything uh one more little uh, read briefly okay. this is from a coffin um that's in cairo that's a couple of thousand years old coffin of petamon i am one that transforms into two i am two that transforms into four i am four that transforms into eight after this i am one um, so excuse me if that's redundant, but but this this kind of abstraction and doubling is where we get the Bagua, the eight elements of the Taoist um, philosophical metaphysical tradition um, that are very much akin to that um, Odin idea that's riding the eight 
principles, right? And thereby kind of getting these intuitive notes through the runes. Um, and, wow. and so the eight elements of the Bagua, of course, are where we get the 64 uh, changes of the Book of Changes, so it multiplies again. And so the, the I Ching, which is the oldest book that's still in print, right, um, is, is based on the Bagua, the eight elements. And, and this is said to be written by none other than Fu Zi. And Fu Zi is the same kind of body. Fu Zi is paired with Nu Wa, often enough, and they both have the same kind of body as Pantanjali, snake from the waist down and human from the waist up. Mm -hmm. And so Fu Zi is depicted, most often depicted with his feminine counterpart. And guess what they're holding? One, uh, of course, uh, the feminine is holding the compass and the masculine is holding the square. This is Taoism uh. in China. <laughs> and they have they so Fuzi is the Thoth energy of Taoism. Um, he is the great teacher of man, and even there's creation stories related to Fuzi and Nuwa. Um, he brought man fishing and geometry and everything in between, um, just like Thoth is the great teacher. Um, so, so, you know, there's a lot of arguments about what hermetics is. And hermetics could be, in a sense, the study of eight elements. <laughs> um, as much as it could be the study of secrets and the study of anything to do with mastery related to, well, fishing through geometry, because that's what these great t teachers brought. Um, so, but, but, uh, it's, it's a, it's a wonderful dynamic that through the eight elements, um, come all these divination properties, um, ways of, uh, connecting through, you know, transcending the limitations of our physical, uh, senses maybe, and catching a flicker of intuition like Thoth. I would like to, um, Go for it. make an observation of, um, not to keep talking about Odin, but when you were talking about him, I, I've always associated Odin with the number nine. And so I kept thinking, well, how can I reconcile this? And then I realized, oh, he's sitting on the horse with eight legs. He, he's the nine. That, he's that one. He's the one, yeah. Right, right. and makes nine. <laughs> yep. So it made a lot of sense then. I thought, oh, okay. So maybe he uses his horse to traverse the realms because there's nine zero, like, you know, just like the tree. And I think that so in that way, his snake legs is the horse, mm, and he right. uses a, uh, the snake legs traverse the quillipot or the lower uh, worlds, the lower energies, and then the upper man energy is the separat. So I, I would say that that's like the Nordic equivalent of that same philosophy. Oh yeah, yeah, there yeah, that's beautiful. <laughs> that was a nice that's right there. there, Lazarus. Hey, there he is. You talk about him, and he shows up. <laughs> Yo, that's funny. Right? Uh, you know, it was something I was thinking. I don't know where this got. I don't know how my mind got to this, but you know, we're talking about eight, and uh, like you were talking before, and I ended up getting sidetracked looking into it because I was like, I could have swore I remembered. Like, didn't we play eight bit video games? And I feel like it just repeated from there, like sixteen, then thirty two. Right, sixty four. Yeah, <laughs> it's like they, they totally do. The they Commodore even do that. The, right. I just thought that was weird. I don't know why, but that popped into my head thinking well, like video well, games. I, I, wanna, I, I, I was just I say, to, Sorry, I please, didn't know, no, no, you know, please go ahead. Go ahead, Branch. Oh, uh, somebody mentioned the um, Ifa or the Yoruba stuff in the chat earlier, and I, I had heard that uh, artificial intelligence, as we know it basically came from the low-tech I Ching of the Yoruba, which I, I didn't know until very recently. So when you just said there about that, kind of reminded me of that as well. So a lot of the technology that we have, like with RAM being multiples of eight, um, and the 
I Ching's uh, kind of also have this numerological component to them. It's like you're kind of tapping into something low tech wise that's there. And computers are like a high tech version of tapping into the same energy. So it's like there's this uh, bedrock of mathematics that kind of oh, yeah. maybe comes from the eight elements and these. Yeah. And I think that creation. polarity system is something that the different groups built on and, and used and, it, but it's not the only thing, right. But it's, it's interesting that, uh, you know, so many, so many have used it with the 64 or rather that the two major significant ones, uh, Taoism and Egyptian uh, uh, culture and the ancients. I, 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 I wanted to mention, so in, in one sense, we see it multiplying and expanding. In another sense, in Egypt, they actually use it as a way to fraction and go the other way. And they relate this, of course, to the eye of Ra. And they relate the eye of Ra to how we all perceive the world, right? So back to um, the eye symbolism, right? So, um, and, and they, the Egyptians, relate the eye symbolism, uh, our sensory capacity symbolized through the eye of Ra, um, in this Heket um, measurement system, which they used for grain. And it was based on the division of one half, one, one quarter, uh, one eighth, one sixteenth, one thirty two, and one sixty four. Of uh, 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 this was the the primary division of the gr- measurement for grain. So the very, you know, important um, and exotic. May, may I, uh... Please, please, Man, break, break it down. I want to add, I love how easy it is to, you're, you're like setting up all these dunks. Man. <laughs> so in Revelation, when it's talking about the four horsemen, uh, the black horse comes out and says, um, a measure of wheat for a penny and a measure of barley for, I think, two, three pennies or something like that. Oh, so he's talking right. about the weight and measures. Right. And how it relates. But again, there's that uh, four horsemen. Well, well, I often think when I see the four relationship, especially there, when I see the four relationship biblically in relation to death, um, I think of the four canoptic jars. Right. The Egyptians were buried. They kept the heart inside. That was the fifth organ that was of ultra importance. And they took out the other four organs of major importance and buried them in the canop- canoptic bars, like the canopy, the covering. Um, um, and so, uh, uh, so, but the Egyptians, they literally measured their grain via the Hecat fraction system. Uh, we lost them. So the heck at, how, I wonder how that would be spelled. H-E-K-A-T maybe? That was making me think of so Hakate. Was, you know, there's so many different yeah, yeah. ways to say her name anyway. So Who's at the crossroads, which is where the eight joins its middle, you know? So maybe oh. there is a weave there. Um, <laughs> I, never, I, I knew her of, the uh, crossroads, but never thought like doing the as above, so below, and that would make like an X or an eight, yeah. Sure. Mm, which is the sagittal plane where heaven and earth meet, the of the pot, the separat meet. I, you could even say that that point is Midgard in the Norse tradition, where the the lands all kind of converge there at a plane. So yeah, that's that's a fun weave. Um, there was a lot. You know what? I'll bring it up. Like uh, people are even saying in chat, I thought this was weird. Some there were some good comments with like even with more eight stuff. Uh, even when I was talking about uh, the eight bit video game, uh, Teresa mentioned something about uh, eight track tapes, and I was like, "Oh yeah!" And then like I think the way, if I remember correctly, like you play it one way, and then like you turn it around, and then it plays the other way. And I even said, like, that's even kind of like almost the eight itself, with like a twisting of pulleys, if you mm-hmm. think about it. And I even said, like, in a sense, that's even representing, in my opinion, what I think happens with your eyes with magic, 
one gets pinned and one gets open. So that you could, I could see that with the way the turning, in a sense, with those eight tracks. One and going the opposite way, making the floor delete, in a sense. No, that's beautiful. Uh, to build on that, uh, uh, one of the most essential Taoist meditation conceptualizations of energy, you end up making an eight with this imaginary flow of energy where you're connecting with the North star, for instance, or a star and rooting with the ground. And so you're kind of, uh, and your, your center Gantian is where that eight intersection would be. And so you're making this huge in your imagination, you know, but the whole, the whole energy flow, it really is eight kind of. And another and thing, Real quick, too, before you move on, I just do want to mention, too, we also had Zaya Bob also mention this. And I thought this was interesting, even thinking about it with, like, Himmler. Even taking into consideration they had 88. You do have 88 constellations, and you do have 88 piano keys. You know, I know that's not eight, but still you're getting, like, double eights and stuff. Right. Well, and and uh, the the whole idea of music to, to piano keys um it's uh, seven notes that are called an octave. And there's different ways to look at that. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a musician to elaborate on the sensibility of that, but it does relate to that frame of consciousness that even when there's a set of seven, you call it an octave. <laughs> yes. Well, it's just like the rainbow, um, how the eighth, C zero would be black, the absence. Right. And then as you get up to uh, violet, um, then when it, all the colors are present, that's your eight. So your octave is actually when you go up a key to the next key. And sure. so you keep traversing that you know, up and down, you know. And this also reminds me of uh, in chemistry, you have the, uh, the valence electrons. You know, you always have eight in your shell. And the noble gases are the ones that occupy that space where they, uh, everyone in that family has an eight in their outer shell and you get incredible electron affinity in the shell that only has seven. So they have that strong ionization energy to, to rob the electron from like metal, for instance. So that's why the reaction between salt and or, or excuse me, sodium and chlorine is so violent, for instance, because mm. it's that seven, it wants to be complete and have eight. Right. So it's like there's this natural tendency for uh, completion to eight. Yeah. And and that's why it's associated with infinity and immortality even, right? Um, because that's kind of like what have people been trying to do with alchemy, right? It's all It's all not necessarily to be immortal in the true sense of the world, but life extension – and, you know, controlling facilitation, the psyche and the self and all these, all these things. <clears throat> and the, the, the yin yang uh, quote, I said, it's very um, alchemical in that processing, in this doubling and unfolding from one and the other. Um, and just to wrap it up, if you, if you go, if you look, Eye of Horus 64 or 1 64th, You'll be able to find oh, the yeah. the sensory uh, sensory system um, that is related to the eye of Horus. Uh, that's based on this same mathematics of going from one to two to four to eight and so on, but in a in the microcosmic, right? Um, and the perfection in the sixty three sixty fourths, in a sense, which. Um, the Bagua kind of has the same aspect as that as well, um, where it's and all all indigenous cultures you'll find have a, a notion of imperfection or incompleteness, and we see this in the Great Pyramid, right? Where's the head? Where's the capstone? Was it ever there? You know, there's debate on that, right? Um, and so um, it being incomplete and that being perfect in itself was something that uh, was uh, shared similarity. But the 63, 64 of the eye are very interesting um, compared to the 64 multiplied uh, of the I Ching. I would uh, 
like to know, do you know which fraction is associated with smell in that diagram? Yes, it's actually in that diagram. It's the most, the majority is smell one half. Wow. Can I yeah. leave on this for a moment? So if you read this story in Genesis about the fall of man, when Eve is tempted by the serpent, um, every mm -hmm. sense is involved except for the smell. So mm -hmm. it's like the purest of our senses. It and, was uh, like, it makes me think that it was fake. If he couldn't smell it and he could sense it with every other thing, was it fake? Well, and fruit come from blossoms, which do have an aroma. Right, but, yeah. So I think it's interesting that never once does it mention that it smelled good. It's and just that it looked good. Great. What she heard sounded good. The circle wow. was pressed up against her body, so there's touch. Um, Very interesting. Very yeah, interesting. So that's why I asked, because it made me think of a smell. And I think that the smell, I mean, right behind our nose is the pineal gland, basically. So I think that there might be a connection mm. there and how it's just basically like a straight shot. Because there's a theory that we used to have uh, fontanelles that hadn't sutured and that this soft area wow. in our head was what they called the lantern of Horus. And uh, it would allow direct communication you know, to our pineal gland through the soft tissue. But our bones have ossified over their uh, lantern now. So, you know, it kind of dulls that ability that we have naturally. So it makes me wonder too about the role of smell might play in that because we can still like smell pheromones and things like right, that too. Of course. So, but uh, I, yeah, thanks think, for letting me interject there. No, that's, that's a great bill. That's an awesome, awesome thought. Mm. Um, I, I think uh, too that the smell is also our most subconscious maybe due to what you, the p potential that you're putting forth there. The smell is our most unconscious sense. And sometimes we don't even know why we don't like a thing, right? We don't, we don't even actively smell Something it. It smells fishy. It's, it's a, it's a pheromone thing. It's a, it's, it's like on a deeper level than we can articulate, but we have a political um, reason for why we don't like this, but it really comes down to primal something we smelled that one time, you know? <laughs> Yo, I've well, been... Go ahead. We have, uh, comparatively to like dogs and cats our smell and, and sharks, for instance, our smell is very uh, much weaker than theirs, sure. but yet you're, you're right. So when we do smell it, it, it is sub <laughs> subconscious really yeah. for us, whereas a dog or a cat, it would be very uh, acute. And, yeah, yeah I've, even, I've even said before, just uh, from like past experiences uh, with like incense. I mean, there's been a few times, even like I guess with magic, depending on like uh, probably more more of like repetitive use of it. Maybe I just happen to have memories from using it anyway. But uh, there's been times where like I'll catch like smells of something, and a lot of times it'll be like incense that I used or a candle. Or some kind of like mix that I made in the past, and uh, it would almost bring me back like that to oh, yeah. such a vivid, vivid memory. You I know, think they it say was like the I was almost there the most, for a second. Most memory relationships of any. Well, sense. there's that one half, and it's funny because yep. I wanted to interject and say that smell is connected to memory and incense and you said both those things just mm. now <laughs> and i think that this is also a reference back to the capstone that you said was missing because uh when i was on the show earlier in the week we were talking about the uh, in the egyptian and christian traditions the first uh piece of land that come up out of the abyss was just a you know an altar and upon that altar was sacrificed the lamb in the Egyptian, it's the lamb, uh, Ramua, begetter of the ram in the pool. So even in the Egyptian tradition, you got a ram coming out of the abyss and being sacrificed on that top. So the capstone is representative of that sacrifice. And so it's only completed when that occurs, I think. So maybe the octave, in a way, is yeah. like a sacrifice in a sense, too. Um, uh, and so the smell of that sacrifice is incense. Prayers are carried with incense. And so the smell aspect that's associated with incense, I think it, it is indeed memory. 
And I think that's the purpose of it is to bring us back in that genetic memory back to the foundation of the earth, back to the foundation of humans or whatever, you know, whether it be a good thing or bad thing, it's meant to bring that genetic memory up out of us, which is why I think maybe it's specific like with frankincense and myrrh or what have you. Um, And as a, uh, I'm not a therapist, but I am a counselor. And so with some of my clients, I'll encourage them to use essential oils or something, but a smell that they're not familiar with and then pair that with something that like they want to study or whatever. And then that way, when they smell it, smell it in school or whatever, it'll bring them back. Like you were saying, to it's great, what they great integration practice. Um, beautiful, beautiful, man. I, I, I love, I love that concept that you're adding. Um, and it reminds me the smell and memory relationship is so powerful. And it reminds me too of Odin's, one of Odin's ravens was memory, right? Yeah, which, and which which is just interesting, but of course it would be. But um, it's it's just a just another another layer. Even just you know, from my experience, um, I even felt like just even just the fact of like my memory, I guess, or my mind even going back to wherever that memory was. Yeah, and tapping into it, and almost like shining a picture behind my eyes to look at. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. that's freaking wild like i was even thinking like you know it's kind of weird that you just made your brain do that through smell or the, that, yeah, that it, almost, it almost leaves you like a gasp for a minute <laughs> it's <laughs> really weird if you think about it like how did it smell kind of trigger such a smell vivid picture like, wow and just i sometimes <laughs> sometimes wonder if that's just like um like you know like kind of almost like uh practicing for magical effects you know being able to start going backwards in like time mm. technically you know, and seeing it that vivid, who knows? You know, and that that could all be a part of Toth too, going back and forth. <laughs> it's funny. Somebody here in the chat is talking about how they would spray like orange smell in the room to try and make the kids smarter. Orange color is often associated with intelligence or mercury, so I think it's kind of interesting they were told to do this. Ah. But I remember also they used to use a certain scent paper in class that made kids concentrate more. Wow. I can't remember what it was, the, the smell was, but they, they've used that technique before in schools. This is interesting. Human smell perception is not influenced by the shape of the odor molecule, but by oscillations in which electrons will quantum tunnel across energy gaps in the olfactory receptors. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> That just even well, sounds like really, I don't know why. Uh, you know what? I, I think this would um, be kind of like a good time to uh, kind of like ask you both. But um, I have come to like the thought where, I mean, I guess Toth might, or Tahuti or Toth, however you want to say his name. Um, I guess like I'll just pick that one because that's who we're talking about. But, you know, there are other gods that I think is... Like, the hero's journey. I think that, like, Toth is just, like, a character that's used in that. But, like, it's, it's like, all the same story. It's just different times or different, like, parts of that journey. You know, and I do think that, like, Toth, you might actually see kind of, like, arc and change characters, but not necessarily be considered Toth again. You know what I'm saying? You know how I was, like, saying there's a, a, a like, um... Hode or uh, Mercury would be a lower arc of Chesed or um, Jupiter on the Tree of Life, you know. So I I was just wondering, like, in the way, because, like, even basically how you were guys were talking before, you were even showing similarities between Toth and other gods anyway. But, I mean, do you think that it's um, a possibility that it's a little bit more than most people kind of realize? The Thoth energy comes up in the Jesus story. And, and as I was mentioning earlier, uh, Fuzi and, and his feminine counterpart, Nuwa, totally demonstrate Thoth. And not, uh, barely, not even Thoth energy, but you just say Thoth. But, but the Thoth energy comes up in many different stories. I think maybe because he was so inspirational that he was so popular and thus integrated. Um, 
you know, he, he just, people um, empathize with his inspiration towards mastery and they brought um, uh, aspects of him into their teachings. Mm. Even like it, when I look at the tree, you know, again, Hode is the eighth sphere and that's where I would consider him with Mercury. And you know, again, you have eight there. You know, even when you, like, um, look at the symbolism associated with Kabbalah, the magical image that is supposed to be associated with it, if you look at, like, tarot and put tarot down on the tree and just, like, even see how the male energy does change, even, like, if you place them in the right way, that I do think it's, like, kind of like Toth really is the eighth sphere and then, like, it's just a gradual change into different characters as he goes up, mm. you know? So, like, I, I do think that, like, sometimes there's, like, uh, maybe other other ways of showing him, but it's just not to Hootie or Toth anymore. You know, that's what I'm right. saying. Oh, also, yeah. it reminds me of thought a little bit. It's very close to that word yeah, as well. I think I think they're intimately related, but but uh, etymologically, the the mainstream studies don't necessarily say that, but sure seems to be. Thought and Thoth sure seem to be. Oh, yeah. Well, and one of the reasons I say that is because if you read the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, there's this conversation that takes place between him and Poimandres, again, another dragon. And as it's dictating to him the word, uh, he explains how uh, there was the first cause or reason. And that was like the son of Poimandres or something like that. And that kind of reminds me of kind of what we're talking about here, like reason would be thought. You know, like the age of reason is like a good way to kind of bring them, I guess. That without reason, there couldn't be a reality. No, uh, I, was, I was going to mention, too, that uh, um, the Egyptian cosmology is so long and over, you know, there's different ways to look at it, but one aspect of it has... Um, a four basis that is often construed or considered as a dual basis, right? Like many different things, like the yin and yang, for instance. Um, there's the um, realm of the living and the realm of the dead, right? Where this is, these, these are usually the two. Um, and But there's also the realm of the gods. And then within the realm of the gods is a place that ascendant beings can go, right? And very few go there. Thoth goes there all the time, all right? But but um, there's there's this minor fourth aspect um, in that um, Egyptian worldview or cosmological view: um, the dead, the living, the gods, and just a little bit of entry point that um, certain masters can enter. Um, and uh, it, it reminds me of many different, you know, the minor and major yin and yang uh, reminds me of. Um, and it also, in a sense, maybe has uh, an aspect of the first four characters of the Bible and actually every most every creation story has four characters at their basis and beginning the masculine and feminine and the goodness and the detractor of goodness um, you, you have the uh, three mothers in Hebrew as well and then it expands out to more but uh, that would kind of imply how the logos uniforms. Uh, I think the three mothers in Hebrew are Mem, Shin, and Aleph. That would be the matrix, actually. The womb that gives birth to all of the other mm. creation of those three letters there. It all starts with them. And then every letter is a Yod. Uh, com you know, several Yods together make up different letters in the alph alphabet. So I think it all starts with a seed. So maybe in the Thoth tradition, reason or the Logos is like that seed that, you know, extrapolates upon itself. The two becomes four, the four becomes eight. And like everything that we, just like cell division, you know, our human bodies yeah. like that in a way. The 108 kind of works like that too. And sacred geometry, the four dimensions of sacred geometry, one could, could 
perceive it as working like that too. Uh, 108 actually also has an energetic symbolism to it. The one is the linear energy. The zero is circular and the eight is spiraling. And the point mm -hmm. is invisible. But this goes to the idea often enough, one zero zero eight is utilized um, just as one zero eight is. So guess how many beads are on the rosary? Oh, 108. Yeah. Same thing with the Yeah, the, the Japamala beads have 108. With one extra bead that's called the Raja bead. And so when they're repeating a mantra, they'll go back and forth. Oh, so excuse it's, me. It's not the rosary. It's the mala, apparently. The yeah. chat corrected me there. We see uh, uh, 59 here in the chat. Yeah. Oh, my thing is Maybe the plus one would make it 60, perhaps. Yeah, I know I had something, though. I do have these type of beads. I came, I specifically made sure that it was uh, 108 because there is things that you could do that are mantras that go, like, in 108 cycles. So uh, I do know that there's something out there. Well, uh, I think uh, you count them, too, as you're doing yeah, the prayers, to, Yeah, right? to make sure that, yeah... It's for more of a counter, actually. That's why I was saying for 108 times. You use that and you just keep counting the bead. You know? So I guess for the rosary, it would be like so many Hail Marys, so on and so forth. And then uh, Welcome back, Ethan. There he is. I'm back. Now, 108 is to represent the amount of Sura Namaskar. If I'm even saying that right. Sun salutations, which is to help connect mind, body, and in universe, hmm. you know something I was thinking about that you uh, you guys were talking about earlier. You were talking about like the numbers uh, two to eight, and I do believe like that's what you're seeing with like uh, Tote's path is like those even numbers, you know, replicating. Um, but that's also kind of goes along with the size of your pupils. They will go from two millimeters to eight millimeters, but it's done in sections or like times three in a sense it will go from two to four four to six and then six to eight you know but in so but and then it screws too so like i don't know i was thinking a lot about like just uh the numbers again the two to eight and the separations you know it's done in three times and you see that done you know it was just like weird stuff that yeah. popped up into my uh, head and, with, the, with the play young young said that where there are three there's the fourth, the unsaid fourth, which I think is applicable to the seven and the eight idea as well. Mm -hmm. Where there's seven, there's the unsaid eight. And back to the original, uh, the ancient primal gods of Egypt, the Neaters, um, the one that might correspond to the missing aspect, if there were to be, um, would be uh, the abyss, the, the primal feminine. Um, and, and also I wanted to mention too, in the, in the ancient Greek celebration of seven, which is where we get a lot of, uh, our, our notions of the value of seven, not to, not, I'm not saying it's not valuable. Um, there is the seven spheres, but it's important to consider, Hey, where are we? We would be the eighth in that model, right? That's a good point. Yeah. Could be. Yeah. Um, you said something that reminded me of alchemy. Uh, once again. I got alchemy on the brain today. Um, the four out of three is shown in the geometry of the rebus at illustration, where he's rising up, uh, the hermaphrodites rising up out of the egg with uh, with the four three diagram, or is it three out of four? I think it's four out of three actually. Um, but that's what that reminded me of. And, and uh, you oh, remind so, me of another so, alchemy. No, no, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, well, go ahead because if it's alchemy, related, well, it was just in line with what you're saying that uh, the the philosophy. Many notions of the philosopher's stone talk about getting the fourth from the three, and yeah. and that's you know that's in line with your your uh, depiction there. Because you're multiplying the stone, too, and adding qualities to it and refining it. Like the two dragons, for instance, the red and white 
So that would be like your Rebus and Albedo, I think, um, as it's you know, going through that process. And then they receive their crown, uh, which is like a completion and refinement. And I was reading about antimony <clears throat> earlier as well. But what I was going to add uh, wasn't alchemy related, so that's why I wanted you to go ahead. But did you hear the news? Um, there's going to be a funeral later this week for nine to seven, eight, nine. And uh, so if you guys out there feeling for nine after it got cannibalized by seven, <laughs> you know, just remember nine in your prayers. Uh, um, oh, man, I was going to say, so. oh, I don't want to, I hate to put you on the spot either, but I was thinking about maybe uh, we'll talk about this for a little bit and then maybe we can wrap it up after this. But I know it's something that you have talked about on my show before, so I know it's not like, you know, you know, totally throw you off guard. But going back to, like, four, how you were saying, like, the one and the three, you know, I've been saying that I've seen that a lot in a lot of, like, neither true crime or occultism and just other things, even with the eye. So I was wondering, like, if you wanted to, like, maybe, we or we could all, like, kick around, like, the one and the three and the four for maybe a little bit, just to end yeah, it there. Yeah, absolutely. I'm always... Um I'm always into that. Well, you initially remind me of the taboo nature of 13, which is the one and the three. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and in the East, the same type of taboo where in some countries and some cities at some points in time, they didn't have a fourth floor, just like some buildings here might not have the 13th. Right. <laughs> Wow. And so, so um, you know, you know why they changed that? They were like, "Listen, we stick out and make as much money as we can, <laughs> so we'll make it. It will make a one and a three because you know it matches four. So now we can go up to 12. <laughs> I mean, it's it, I, I, I just thought that was just psych, such a psychological flaw when you do that, you yeah. know. But but that's how taboo. 13 was yeah. in some places and how taboo four is in some places um, in the East um, <clears throat> it's in, in Mandarin and Japanese and uh, Korean even, I think four is a homonym with death, right? So that's where they get this kind of not always a fear of four, but like a woe of four and actually to in, in the, in the West, we would have this and more a couple a hundred years ago and, and certainly a thousand years ago. It, uh, there's time periods and places where people would be killed for saying the tetragrammaton or saying the, the four lettered word for God. Yeah. Um, That's why it was taken out of the Bible. Right. And it would just be, uh, well, well, we see it now. It's Lord even is a, is a substitute for the Tetragrammaton. And sometimes there, there's papers and writings where they would have a dot or four dots because it just wasn't supposed to be mentioned aloud. And even when you were reading it, even if you were a pervade scholar, you, you weren't supposed to even think it in your, you know. Um, well, but I think that's, uh, terrible in a way too because now oh, totally. so many so many people don't know the name of god and it says very clearly like in scripture call upon the name of the lord well you're not really using his name anymore so it's well, like what is it right what is lord <laughs> yeah. so it's if kind of have, ironic some Bibles you know? have like an asterisk like adonai el elohim exactly. lord what, what you go back and what well what is that tetragrammaton yeah. Um, and and but wait, l let's break down tetragrammaton real quick. And why is it so taboo on a really metaphysical um, level? Tetragrammaton. Um, let's get to the metaphysical in a second. Um, in the most basic level, tetragrammaton, what it most fundamentally means is for grammar. And grammar is mathematical and linguistic understanding back in the day. There wasn't numbers, there was letters, right? That's why, like, Greek numbers are X, they're, num they're letters. So grammar was like gematria, in, in, a, in a sense, or, and, rather, and, or like um, the study of a certain science. 
you have a whole grammar set up to uh, how to work oh. a kennel, a kennel or something. You have a whole like grammar. A or, or jargon. It's, it's it's a it's a a, a lingo, um, but 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 a but a serious lingo, right? It's a a, um, a a grammar, you know, of of understanding what. I love how you use the Roman numerology for that. I never really thought and, of that. and and it really is grammar is that's why we say like if I go get some weed, is there twenty eight grams is in this ounce, <laughs> <laughs> or in the soul. There's uh, so many grams of this, that the soul is supposed to weigh, right? Right, right, yeah, I right. It. I think it's 23 grams. They say when you you know you'll zap. You, so you'll if you're, zap uh, oh. you don't want your uh, soul to weigh more than that feather of mat, so maybe it weighs 23 grams that feather. Mm. Right, beautiful, and and uh, so uh, the tetragrammaton. Um, is the the Greek name for the Hebrew name for God, um, the four letter Hebrew word for God, um, and it's said that um, Hebrew, and I think we can we can find this true for many different teachings, but it's said that the language of Hebrew has its um, uh, metaphysical and es- obvious. Um, interpretations mm-hmm. and and understandings, um, and if we break down uh, the the four individual letters of the tetragrammaton, it actually depicts the four dimensions of geometry. You have the point is literally a point, mm-hmm. and you have um, the line. And it, which is, uh, uh, it's a nail. It's like, is a peg is often the, the translation, right? Um, it, these are um, the, the exoteric properties of these letters, but the esoteric, the metaphysical is that it's the point, the line. And then you have the repeated uh, uh, letter, which is the circle and the sphere or the solid. Right. Um, and and so in 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 the Tetragrammaton, in the most widely read book in the West, what are what is it? What is God? It's the four dimensions of sacred geometry. <laughs> I mean, you can't make it up, but it sounds like I am. Um, sounds but, like a great architect. That's oh. right. That's what the the true master builder is, good sir. Noti- noting that relationship, that's what the true master builder is, the one that can be the created and create. And oh, dude, uh, this, you were talking about the square and the compass earlier, and it just hit me all of a sudden. In the Masonic it. Lodge, the square, compass, and Bible are on the altar in the middle. So you got your three there. So maybe three and four is this relationship of the tetragrammaton to those three things, the three, the lesser well, lights. So I see there, there's the tetragrammaton in the Bible right off. Uh, not that I, I'm ne- not necessarily as knowledgeable as you on this, but, but I think of the joining of, um, with with the with the measurement system of the of the square and the compass, in the exoteric sense, you have the joining of feminine and masculine yeah. into into what creation, right? So there's that there's that and and it's a measurement system, and and just like with Thoth, he's he's the you know sacred geometer that can measure the immeasurable. Right, they can measure the that can come up with these divination concepts and and understand the the spiritual, the intangible, the ineffable in some yeah. cases. The ineffable, beautiful, yeah, exactly. And uh, when we were talking about the eight earlier and the analemma, it got me thinking too of how a pendulum can be used. And so I almost imagine like at the dawn of creation, the creation of the moon and the sun as they kind of did their analemmas, you know, they're measuring now. It's like a, a, a pendulum, you know, like if you were to hold a pendulum and trace out a, 
Yeah. It talks about that right. in the Bible. It, does, uh, it comes up with, it just does an eight, huh? Yeah. The plumb so, line, I right. guess is what I was thinking of. Well, I, you know, I was thinking about uh, this, what you said just reminds me of, um, I was thinking about masonry and the three. Um, it, the three, what is the expression? Um, death comes in threes. Yeah. Right? Like, and so um, if we look at um, the life story, sometimes we could um, put it into th- uh, uh, three concepts, birth, life, death. Oh, man. And there's three of us on the <laughs> stream. <laughs> yeah. Reminds me of the uh, maiden lady crone and the Sphinx story once again. You know, it was three phases of life. What I, uh, I was gonna say about even with three, um, I don't know how you look at it, but like I know, like I in ceremonial magic will be like Yod Hey Vod Hey, you know, Y H V H. And I mean, if you look at that, technically you're only using three letters, but yet it's, yeah, because one repeats. That's yeah. a good point. Yes. Yeah, so um, in fact, is, the Hey is your arms and legs so the two parts that repeat are actually there on your body too because the yod hey vav is also the vessel of the human body an image of god as it were yeah i don't know if you heard anything that i had said ethan um i didn't know i was saying i heard with you know in like ceremonial magic i'm used to like yod hey vav hey is being uh you know the four but that's only three letters again right you know, so I do find that interesting how you're still getting only you know, a three and then a, a one, I guess. I, and I think it's due to the, well, the, the exoteric the nature of, of describing circle and sphere, right? Um, because the sphere is the most, um, maybe perfect is the wrong word, but the, but the maybe best um, depiction of a solid, right? Oh, the circumference. You, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and and actually, if you look at tarot, tarot has this four-dimensional sacred geometry in it too. The cup is the sphere, right? The coin is the circle. And so, in a in a three-dimensional depiction of a two-dimensional depiction of a sphere and a circle, you kind of have the same letter or the same drawing. <laughs> um, but so so the uh, and of course. The sword is the point, and the wands are are the lines. Um, But I was going to say Jesus has the story of four in in his whole uh, life story, and birth, life, death, and the magic, the resurrection. And when we've gone through a death process, not necessarily literally, but the resurrection or the reunification, that's where it really is a transcendent uh, process. And and the tetragrammaton, the four elements of that, I think um, there is definitely the chemical aspect of the, um, the four elements of alchemy. But there's also, what do they say behind alchemy? You have to have the appropriate mindset for any of this to work. And I feel like... You got to have faith. You got to have the right orientation within, or this physical forum elements that you know of. It's not going to work. And I feel like there's the two uh, definitions of element. The element is the chemical uh, uh, constitution, and it's also the parts of a thing, the parts of a set. Oh, dude, mint. A lot of times in what Latin or Greek is mind, and uh, L is a lot of times associated with God. So you can almost say like element is almost like God mind. Mm. Oh wow! Yeah. It's I've never right made there. That connection before. It's <laughs> right there. It's L meant, just like the just like that's, we, that's beautiful, man. That's a, that's <laughs> that that brings out the tetragrammaton in a beautiful way. That's excellent. I had somebody one time in chat, or I don't know if it was in chat or if they left it as a comment. They mentioned something about, like, actually, like, studying the element chart, looking at it from an occult aspect. And I actually was like, you know, I've thought of doing that before, so maybe there is something behind that. Somebody well, else even mentioned that. There's the uh, 
Salts of Salvation is a book, and uh, in alchemy, you can assign different compounds with each of the zodiac signs, zodiacal signs. So if you're born as an Aries, like me, for instance, then you might be missing other certain salts. And so you want to consume those in your diet so that you get that balance back because you're missing three months worth of salts. Um, Teresa mentioned here in the chat about the Masons being obsessed with three not acknowledging the master of this fourth. Well, in the story of Hiram of Biff, who is the master, and he has that ineffable word, the mm -hmm. three ruffians accost him and kill him, mm -hmm. trying to get it. He's he won't the fourth. Give it up. Yeah. He's the fourth. And there's then a deeper dimension to it where they then resurrect him, um, mm -hmm. but can't resurrect him completely. They can only resurrect his, his skeleton or his bones, which is very Saturnian. And that's how they're able to get some of the word back, uh, but amazing. not all of it. And so that's wow. why they say that they are still searching for the lost word. It's whatever Hiram knew. Um, mm. And she mentions also Acts 4, 11 through 12, that Jesus says, uh, Jesus is the stone that was rejected by the builders, which has become the head of the cornerstone. So just like Hiram being slain, Jesus was slain in a similar attitude there about having the, the secrets, which he's the fifth element to the Tetragrammaton, and much right. in the same way Hiram's the fourth element to the three thing there. But the three zodiacal signs associated with the death of Hiram would be the, uh, I think it was uh, uh, Capricorn, Scorpio, and Sagittarius, perhaps. I could be wrong about that. It's been a while since I looked at it, but it's usually the winter months. So uh, if you look at that through a periodic chart, you could even look at the salts that are associated with that. Um, and, of course, that would be the thigh, Sagittarius's thigh, Capricorn's knee, um, Scorpio would be the, the generative area, which in the chariot card, that's where the legs are usually cut off is at that point, too. So maybe there's something to it. Hmm. I found that interesting with the three and the one. I was, didn't even realize that. What, what, you, what you said a yeah, little bit that's, ago. That's, I'm still thinking about the Sorry, yeah. It's like, hmm, Well, and okay. they killed him with the tools in the temple. So he was struck the first time, I think, with uh, the ruler. Um, and then I think the next one was square. And uh, then the third was the maul in the head. That'll do so, it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it. which is a head wound and the antichrist has association with the deadly head wound that was healed so I often think about that story whenever oh. you hear that um, I was going to say in the bible there's one of there's a blessing and it uses the word countenance there might be might be oh, yeah. more, more than one blessing that uses the word countenance and the word countenance, it implies or means the face of God and the tetragrammaton. And it and but it but it most literally means may the count ten. Right? So it, it, in in countenance is the word count ten. Ints. The quality of count ten may it bless you. What what do they mean by count ten? Not necessarily the decimal system. Actually, the one point, the two points for the line, the three points for the uh, minimum number to create a uh, plane, and four points for the minimum number to create a solid. Those are that's the count ten is sacred geometry of God. <laughs> uh, ten's a lot of times associated with the completion as well, like a perfection. Right, right. Well, and I think I think to the sacred geometry idea, right? Or at least maybe maybe it's not the origination, but it has the, uh, that set of completion in it, the ten points. Um, I'd like to weave back here on the uh, earlier you mentioned the tetragrammaton how it was um, like a point that emanated down into the line and then so on and so forth well it, it put me in mind of a tent um, I've seen mm. that, that 
tetragrammatons a lot of times like a pyramidal type shape. Right. And um, the Meru Foundation online does a lot of Hebrew studies, and they have a they have an incredible rabbit hole you can go down where he created this uh, metal thing that he puts into his hand to where it, it, he models his hand after like the Yod character. And the Hebrew language is as such that if you, you can make every single Hebrew letter as a shadow on the wall with your hand. So the hand is the Yod actually. And um, you can, and he fits this shape. It is like half of a Taurus can fit inside of an apple can also fit in the side of the palm of your hand. And, um, he's able to use it in that way. And so the tetragrammaton itself is that <laughs> it is like that shadow, but, um, it requires light to work. So the Hebrew language itself are, is a shadow no, of the light. what the lights cast. So I think I just found that all so remarkable. You got yeah, me thinking that's... of the, the tent. And this is like a, so there's like a lantern inside a tent. And that's the eyeball and the triangle that we see. I think it's kind of that symbolism there too. Shit. You know, because uh, I don't want to forget this. You guys are talking about the tent and then you said the light. Um, I, I even think that light might even possibly be like in the lamp that the hermit is holding. Which if, depending on how you look at it, could yeah, possibly he has a look, yod look in like there tent. in some cases. Yeah, but, exactly. uh so I know from my experiences in the OTO and from, I think I'm pretty sure in other ones too, you will see tents at some point, in some sort of neither ceremony or initiation. You know, from my experience, you will see a tent well, and that's, actually. Uh, the set spirit up. of uh, Yahweh descended into the tents of the uh, Hebrews and um, they would you know, speak with them and talk with them and, particularly with Moses and Joshua, um, we see that story. So maybe it's a connection to that. I, I would also associate the tent in that way with almost like an Abramelin type feel to it, like uh, retreating into the wilderness. Mm. And also in fall, the Hebrews are instructed to go out into the woods for the time of tabernacles and construct a tent out of branches and wood. Mm. And the requirement is that it has to, you have to be able to see the stars through the roof. Um, so it's not completely covered. It's just a shelter so that you're kind of uh, relying on God to protect you from the elements. So very much a yud hey bav hey kind of feel there, I think. The angel would be in the doorway protecting you. <laughs> uh, you know, another thing uh, Lazarus was joking about, like even you do see... I mean, you do see clown symbolism and carnival symbolism, I think, is, is used in a clown. That's the fool. So. Yeah, Under so, the... I mean, uh, I would even say you could even look at maybe possibly stuff like that. You know? North Star, um, Axis Mundi symbolism there, too. And I I even have thought, in my opinion, and, and looking at Tarot, too, um, where it falls, and from doing the Eyeball series, I have questioned if the tent is to uh, symbolize the optic nerve and then the light would actually be like going back up the optic nerve, you know, where where uh, sunlight turns into electricity, is converted into electricity. So mm -hmm. because the optic nerve, if you were to go look at it, could be looked like a tent. Uh, I have seen Empress cards that have been drawn that, to my opinion, do have a certain flow to the card or they're in their way. To kind of look like uh, an optic, you know, the optic nerve hanging down like that. Well, that uh, the tattoo, I can't remember. It's like a uh, recursive star or something. I can't remember. Oh, the, the unicrystal hexagram, yeah. That reminds me of the Lucifer sigil um, with the eyes, how it kind of crosses the optic nerve there. It's very much well, like. And that. it reminds me too of the, the word occult. And the word octave and and the uh, um, the eye, right? The, what's what's the word for eye that has the OC? Sorry, I just I just I'm spacing it. Oculus or the ocular. Oculus, yeah, the ocular ocular studies, right? So there's the OC in in all of this, which is oh yeah, or yeah. to be oracular. Oracle. Yeah, you, 
if you go look <laughs> up, uh, you could go see. I mean, I made a post about it not too long ago. NASA, uh, I forgot. I think they were like explaining how they screwed up on like one of their telescopes, and they show you how the light reflects, and it's the same exact fucking thing. I was that too. Hmm. Same exact thing. So weird. Well, and it's actually our reality's flipped. We our brain has to flip it. Yeah, right? it's and, as above, so below yeah, inside so your yeah. eyeballs. <laughs> That's pretty wild when you think about on it. On your lens, exactly. That's what that happens on your lens. Shit gets flipped back. So yeah. Yeah. Um, I think we'll uh, wrap it up there if you guys don't mind. Cool. Yeah, yeah. that was excellent. That I was, had a that great talk. Really Thank you. Firing. Thank you. Yeah. For the talk. Definitely a great talk with both of you on. That's why I uh, I made it happen. Um, awesome. Branch, real quick, remind everybody where they can find you at. And if you want to plug your old YouTube or whatever or anything like that, go for it. Or didn't you have like an old podcast well, or something? Well, you can find me um, on YouTube. I uh, recorded several shows with a partner. Uh, on the, we, it got nuked, so we had to rename it. She named it Abby Someone <laughs> uh, and uh, NPC 3.14. And Abby, someone we did about sixty streams together. Um, we, you know, would do the Psalms, uh, do some star look at the stars and placements of the planets each time we do a show, tracking current events and prophecy, those sorts of things. So it was a lot of fun. Uh, very interesting shows. Um, probably over the course of two, two, three years. So it really cataloged a lot of the chaos that was going on in the last few years. Um, you can also find me on Telegram as The Branch or on Instagram as Appalachian Aesthetic. I uh, really love meeting new people and having conversations, so hit me up. Awesome. Thank you very much, and I'm pretty sure I have that stuff in the bottom. If I don't, I will add it after the fact. And Ethan, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, thank you. Of course, of course. And let everybody know about your stuff again. Yeah, um, I have books on Amazon. I got a little YouTube thing on all the social media. Ethan Indigo should be pretty pretty easy to find usually. And I'll try to try to make interesting stuff here and there. Don't you even have like a sorry, like a website that you add stuff to also? Yeah, the uh, I got a couple Weebly sites. Geometry of Energy yeah. has has a bunch of stuff on there. Uh, Matrix of Four. I think I included something. I know I included the one that yeah, was wonderful. on your Twitter. Wonderful. So I put that in there. Yeah, something of yours. And yeah. I've I've checked it out. So uh, yeah, I have uh, that those links in the bottom. And uh, thank you both again very much for coming on. And thank you everybody in awesome. the chat. We had a lot of people in the chat. I threw up comments. Put them up on the screen. You know, I mentioned some of them. Uh, that's what's up. I love it. Uh, there was a great discussion in the chat, and I think there was a lot of information in the chat as well. So uh, if you're watching the video, I highly suggest to check out the chat. Yeah, it was always good uh, very there. interactive. I really loved hanging out with the chat, too. Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. I was like, yo, this is great. He's even typing in the chat, too. That's what's up. So, yeah, it was a good time tonight. Thank you all. I had a pretty uh, pretty fun and interesting Friday night. So that's what's up. And that is the Thanks. end of another Occult Rejects. And until the next one, everybody be well. Later. <laughs>